fourth graders, it's our last time to read Walk Two Moons by Sharon Creech. And we are reading the final two chapters. And we'll be finished. And this has been a great, great read aloud with you guys. And um, I wish I could have done it in person. But I've really enjoyed finishing it up with the ones that have been wanting to watch it and listen to it. And um, I want to do some kind of maybe review before we go back to school this fall. Just so you can make sure you do a great job on your AR test for it. And so we'll do a good little, maybe a book talk or review together um, this the end of the summer before we go back to school. So it'll be here before we know it. So um, I will finish reading now. Chapter 43 and 44, and we'll be done. Okay, so chapter 43 is called Our Gooseberry. So Graham is Gooseberry, right? And she is sick and in the hospital. So let's see what's going to happen. <clears throat> and, oh yeah, and the sheriff, um, Sal just told him, told him, you can take me to jail now. That's how the last chapter ended. Okay. Instead of taking me to jail, the sheriff drove me to Cordell Lane, I'm pretty sure that, I don't know if that's how you say it, but this is a place in Idaho where they were staying, and that's where they were, where Graham is in the hospital. We had the deputy following us in Grant's car. The sheriff gave me a lengthy whew, and severe lecture about driving without a license, and he made me promise I would never drive again until I was 16. Not even on Grandpa's farm. Not even on Grandpa's farm? Hmm. He looked straight ahead of the road. Well, I suppose people are going to do whatever they want to do on their own farms. <laughs> he said, as long as they have a lot of room to maneuver and as long as they're not endangering the lives of any other persons or animals. But I'm not saying you ought to. I'm not giving you permission or anything. <laughs> I asked him to tell me about the bus accident. When I asked him if he had been there that night, and if he had seen anyone brought out of the bus, he said, you don't want to know all that. A person shouldn't have to think about those things, he said. Well, did you see my mother? I saw a lot of people, Sal. And maybe I saw your mother. Maybe I didn't. I don't know. But I'm sorry to say that if I did see her, I didn't know it. I remember your father coming into the station. And I do remember that. But I wasn't with him when... Well, I wasn't there when. Well, did you see Miss Cadaver? I said. How do you know about Miss Cadaver? He said. Well, of course, I saw Miss Cadaver. Everyone saw Miss Cadaver. Nine hours after the bus rolled over, and all those stretchers were being carried up the hill, and everyone despairing, there was her hand coming out of that window, and everyone was shouting because there was a moving hand. He glanced at me. I wish it had been your mother's hand. Miss Cadaver was sitting next to my mother, I said. Oh, he said. They were strangers to each other when they got on that bus, but by the time they got off, six days later, they were friends. My mother told Miss Cadaver all about me and my father and our farm at ba and by banks, and she told Miss Cadaver about the fields and the blackberries and Moody Blue and and the chickens and that singing tree. And I think if she told Miss Cadaver all that, then my mother must have been missing us. Don't you think? Oh, I'm sure of it, the sheriff said. And how do you know all this? So then I explained to him how Miss Cadaver had told me all this on the day uh, Phoebe's mother had returned. And Miss Cadaver told me all about my father and visiting her in the hospital in Lewiston after he had buried my mother. And he came to see the only survivor of the bus crash. And when he learned that Miss Cadaver had been sitting next to my mother, then they started talking about her and they talked for six hours. Miss Cadaver told me all about her and my father writing to each other and how my father needed to get away from Bye Banks for a while. And I asked Miss Cadaver why my father hadn't told me how he had met her. And he didn't want, he didn't want to upset me is what he said. But he thought I might also dislike Miss Cadaver, um, Miss Cadaver, Margaret, because she had survived the bus crash and my mother did not. Well, do you love him? I had to, I had to ask her. Are you going to marry him? Oh, goodness, she said. It's a little early for that. 
he's holding on to me because I was with your mother and held her hand in those last moments. Your father isn't ready to love anyone else yet. And your mother was one of a kind. That's true. She was. Mm -hmm. And even though Miss Cadaver had told me all this, and it told me how she had been with my mother in her last minutes, I still did not believe that my mother was actually dead. I still thought that there might have been a mistake. I didn't, I don't know what I hoped to find in Lewiston, or maybe I expected that I'd see her walking through a field and I would call to her and she would say, Oh, Salamanca, my left arm. And, oh, Salamanca, take me home. I slept for the last 50 miles on the way to the hospital when I awoke and I was sitting in the sheriff's car outside the hospital entrance. The sheriff was coming out of the hospital and he handed me an envelope and he slid in beside me on the seat. In the envelope was a note from Gramps, given the name of the motel he was staying at, and beneath it he had written, I am sorry to say that our gooseberry died at 3 o'clock this morning. Mm. Gramps was sitting on the side of the bed in the motel talking on the phone when he saw me and the sheriff at the door. He put the phone down and he hugged me. And the sheriff told Gramps how sorry he was and that he didn't think it was time or place to give anybody a lecture about an underage granddaughter driving down a mountainside in the middle of the night. But he handed Gramps my car, his car keys and he asked Gramps if he needed any help making arrangements that he would help. Graham said he had taken care of most things and Graham's body was being flown back to Bob Banks where my father would meet the plane. Gramps and I were going to finish what we had come to do and what had to be done here and leave the next morning. After the sheriff and his de deputy left, I noticed Graham's and Gramps' open suitcase and inside were Graham's things all mixed in with Gramps' clothes and I picked up her baby powder and I smelled it and on the desk was a crumpled letter, and when Gramps saw me look at it, he said, I wrote her a letter last night. It's a love letter, he said. Gramps lay down on the bed and stared up at the ceiling. Chicka bitty, he said, I miss my gooseberry. And he put one arm over his eyes, and he hand, his hand, other hand patted the empty space beside him. This ain't, he said, this ain't, it's okay, I said. I sat down on the other side of the bed and I held his hand. This ain't your marriage bed, I said. About five minutes later, Gramps cleared his throat and said, but it'll have to do. Mm, this is so sad. <sighs> okay, so by Banks, chapter 44. The name of this chapter is by Banks. So this is, by Banks is where, you know, she was originally from. That's where this, where it really all started and where she lived on the farm um, in Kentucky. So we're back in by Banks now. And my father and I are living on our farm again. Yay. And Gramps is living with us. Graham is buried in the Aspen Grove where she and Gramps were married. We miss our gooseberry every single day. Lately, I've been wondering if there might be something hidden behind the fireplace because just as the fireplace was behind the plaster wall and my mother's story was behind Phoebe's, I think there's a third story behind Phoebe's and my mother's and that that was about Graham and Gramps. On the day after Graham was buried, her friend Gloria, the one Graham thought was so much like Phoebe, the one that had, been, had a hankering for Gramps, came to visit Gramps. Hmm. They sat on the porch while Gramps talked about Graham for four straight hours, and Gloria asked if we had any aspirin. She had a grand headache. We haven't seen her since. <laughs> so I guess Gloria didn't like that he sat there and talked about Graham for four hours. <laughs> I guess Graham was right, too. I wrote to Tom Fleet, the boy who had helped Graham when the snake took a bite out of her leg. And I told him that Graham made it back to Bye Banks, but unfortunately she came in a coffin. I described the Aspen Grove where she was buried and I told him about the river nearby. And he wrote back saying that he was sorry about Graham and maybe he could come and visit the Aspen Grove one day. And then he asked, is your river bank private property? <laughs> Gramps has given me more driving, dr driving lessons in the pickup truck and 
We practice over at Gramps Old Farm where the new owner lets us clonk around on the dirt roads. With us rides Gramps' new beagle puppy, which is named Huzza Huzza. And Gramps pets the puppy and smokes his pipe as I drive and we both play the moccasin game. It's a game we made up on our way back from Idaho. We take turns pretending we were walking in someone else's moccasins. If I were walking in Peavy's moccasins, I'd be jealous of a new brother dropping out of the sky. <laughs> well, if I were walking in Graham's moccasins right this minute, I'd want to cool my feet in that river over there. Well, if I were walking in Ben's moccasins, I'd miss Salamanca Hiddle. On and on and on we go. We walk in everybody's moccasins, and we had, and we have discovered some interesting things along the way. One day, I realized that our whole trip out to Lewiston had been a gift from Graham and Grants to me. They were giving me a chance to walk in my mother's moccasins to see what she had seen and feel what she might have felt on her last trip. I also realized that there was lots of reasons why my father didn't take me to Idaho when he got the news of her death. He was too grief stricken and he was trying to spare me. Only later did he understand that I had to go and see for myself. He was right about one thing though. We didn't need to bring her body back because she was in the trees, in the barn, the fields. Gramps is different and he needs Graham right here. He needs to walk out to that aspen grove and see his gooseberry. One afternoon, after we were talking about Prometheus stealing fire from the sun to give to man about Pandora opening up the forbidden box with all the evils of the world in it, Grant said that those myths evolved because people needed a way to explain where fire came from and why there was evil in the world. That made me think of Phoebe and the lunatic, and I said, well, if I were walking in Phoebe's moccasins, I would have to believe in a lunatic and an axe-wielding Mrs. Cadaver to explain my mother's disappearance. Phoebe and her mother helped me, I think. They helped me to think about and understand my own mother. Phoebe's tales were like my fishing in the air. For I, while I needed to believe that my mother was not dead and that she would come back. I still fish in the air sometimes, though. Seems to me that we can't explain all the truly awful things in the world like war and murder and brain tumors. and We can't fix these things, so we look at the frightening things that are closer to us and we magnify them until they burst open inside of something that we can manage, something that isn't as awful as it had at first seemed. It is a relief to discover that although there might be axe murderers and kidnappers in the world, most people seem a lot like us. Sometimes afraid and sometimes brave, sometimes cruel and sometimes kind. I decided that bravery is looking Pandora's box full in the eye as best as you can and then turning to the other box, the one with the smooth, beautiful folds inside, like mama's kisses, kissing trees and my gram saying huzza huzza and Gramps and her and Graham's marriage bed and my mother's postcards and her hair are still beneath the floorboards in my room and I reread all those postcards when I came home and Graham and Gramps and I have been to every place my mother had and there are the Black Hills and Mount Rushmore in the Badlands the only card that is still hard for me to read is the one from Cora Dallin, the one that I received two days after she died. Mm, that'd be hard. And when I drive Gramps around in his truck, I also tell him all the stories my mother told me. His favorite is a Navajo one about Estelanthia. Wow. <laughs> She's a woman who never dies. And she grows from baby to mother to old woman and then returns back to being a baby again and then on and on and on she goes living a thousand and thousand lives, and Gramps likes this. So do I. I still climb the sugar maple tree, and I have heard the singing tree sing, and the sugar maple tree is my thinking place, and yesterday in the sugar maple, I realized that I was jealous of three things. The first jealousy is a foolish one. 
I'm jealous of whoever Ben wrote about in his journal because it was not me. The second jealousy is that I am jealous that my mother had wanted more children. Wasn't I enough? When I walk in her moccasins, though, I say, well, if I were my mother, I might want more children. Not because I don't love my Salamanca, but because I love her so much. I want more of these. Maybe that is a fish in the air, and maybe it isn't, but it is what I want to believe. The last jealousy is not foolish, nor is it one that will go away just yet. I am still jealous that Phoebe's mother came back and mine did not. I miss my mother. Ben and Phoebe write to me all the time and Ben sent me a Valentine in the middle of October that said, roses are red, dirt is brown. Please be my Valentine or else I'll frown. And there was a PS added, I've never written poetry before. I sent a Valentine back and I said, dry is the desert, wet is the rain, your love for me is not in vain. And I added a PS that said, I've never written any poetry either. Ben and Phoebe and Miss Cadaver and Mrs. Partridge are all coming to visit next month. There is a chance that Mr. Berkway might come as well, but Phoebe hopes not. She does not think she could stand to be in a car for that long with a teacher. My father and I have been scrubbing the house for their visit, and I can't wait to show Phoebe and Ben the swimming hole and the fields and the hayloft and the trees and the cows and the chickens. Blackberry, the chicken that Ben gave me, is queen of the coop. And I'll show Ben her too. I'm hoping also for some blackberry kisses. That's where I start blushing again. But now, Gramps has his beagle, and I have a chicken and a singing tree, and that's the way it is. Huzza, huzza. Oh. Well, I hope you like the story. There was um, definitely some sad things about it, and um, lots of funny things and silly things, but um, I um, hope that you could take something from it, because it is important to walk in other people's shoes. That's one of the, my, probably my favorite things of the book is thinking about that. And I like the game that they, her and her gramps played at the end and um, thinking about, well, how would it feel to be in their shoes and put yourself in there before you judge them or before you um, believe something that may not even be true. You know, just try to experience their, from their side. And um, I also loved um, just how silly and funny it was, but, um, and, but it, you know, all books are not going to be just all fairy tales and happy ever after and, you know, because um, life can be hard sometimes. And so, I like that it was um, seemed real like that, you know, and um, that it, it um, had a lot of um, hardships in it, but it had a lot of good things too. And it ended up being a happy ending and she's still going to get to visit with her um, friends and you know, and her and Gramps and Dad are at the farm, and I think it was a sweet ending, so I hope you enjoyed it too, and um, I'll look forward to figuring out what our next chapter will, book be, will be when, when y'all start fifth grade. Oh my goodness, you know that you're about to be fifth graders. Ah! Um, so, I'll figure that out, and I've got two already picked out that I, know, that I always read to fifth graders, and so I can't wait to read those to you, but I will hopefully see you soon, and thank you for listening, and thank you for sharing this book with me. I love you guys, and miss you bunches. Bye.